Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Bridge. Welcome to service. Welcome to Sunday. We are so excited to be here with you, to be able to worship and hear God's word together. So if this is your first time tuning into the bridge, welcome. We're so happy to have you. If you are part of our body, welcome back. We're glad you're here. If you would, please take this stream and share it with anyone you know who is going through a wilderness season, anyone you know who needs a little extra encouragement um, for their weeks, go ahead and share the stream with them. We'll practice a little bit of evangelism. And then today is Palm Sunday, so we are getting ready to hear an exciting message from our pastor um, and our leadership team here at this church, and we are just so excited to be able to worship with you and look toward Easter, and thanks so much for tuning in. Let's worship.
done oh, Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on Impossible things in your name, they shall be done Amen
Well, good morning and welcome to the Midtown Bridge. I pray that you've been encouraged by what you've experienced so far in our worship experience. Uh, if you are joining in for the first time, my name is Milton. I have the honor of serving here as lead pastor. Well, today is a special day and it's a day in which we're celebrating Palm Sunday. Uh, the symbolism we're going to discuss, explore around Palm Sunday is so significant in our life even today. Uh, it's the moment where Jesus has his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And so today I call our attention to Luke chapter number 19. And we're going to examine verses 28 down to verse 40 of Luke's uh, retelling of this event in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, hey, check this out. Maybe you are still searching out the claims of Christianity. Uh, I want to encourage you this morning to just lean in and lend us your ear as we examine just uh, the relevance of this interaction that happened a couple thousand years ago. And it's bearing on your life even today. Um, as you make your way there, I'm thinking about a story uh, that a former uh, a leader, CEO, who used to work with Steve Jobs. His name is, uh, is Victor Gadanter. Uh, he tells about one of the interactions he had in uh, 2008 with Steve Jobs. He, he says, um, I, I received a call during a religious service that he did not answer. Uh, he said, but yet uh, Jobs, Steve Jobs, he left the message saying he had something urgent to discuss. Uh, Godotra, he, he calls Steve back and he says, hey, Steve, this is Vic. Uh, I said, I'm sorry I didn't answer your call earlier. I was in religious services and the caller ID was said unknown. So therefore, I didn't pick up. Steve laughed and said, Vic, unless the caller ID said God, you should never pick up during religious services. I laughed kind of nervously, as Victor goes on to say. He says, after all, while it was customary for Steve to call during the week upset about something, it was unusual for him to call on Sunday and ask me to call him at his home. I wondered to myself what was so important. So, Vic, we have an urgent issue, one that I need addressed right away. As a matter of fact, I've already assigned someone from my team to help you, and I hope you can fix this by tomorrow, said Steve Jobs. I've been looking at the Google logo on the iPhone, and I'm not happy with the icon. The second O in Google doesn't have the right yellow gradient. It's just wrong, and I'm going to have Greg fix it tomorrow. Is that okay with you? Victor, he pondered. He thought to himself, the CEO of Apple, the tech visionary who revolutionized personal computers, the way we listen to music and the way we think of mobile devices, was worried about the yellow in the O in Google. Needless to say, the problem was fixed. And Godotra, Victor, he says it taught him a lesson on leadership and passion and attention to detail. This is the lesson Victor walked away from with this encounter with Steve Jobs. He says, it was a lesson I would never forget. He says, CEOs should care about details, even shades of yellow on a Sunday. I thought that was so profound as we examine this text in Luke chapter number 19, verses 28 through 30 where we see the CEO of CEOs, the creator of all of heaven and earth, the one who spoke time into existence, the one that before was, was, he already is, Jesus. He's now marching into Jerusalem, the last week of his earthly ministry life. And so this morning, as we examine this text, I like to examine with that thought in mind, attention to details, attention to details. Let's pray. Father, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the incorruptible seed of your word. I pray for the man, woman, boy, or girl who is tuning in, who've yet to come to an astonishment, a revelation of the profoundness and the love you have for them through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that salvation would visit their household today. Would you draw men and women unto yourself? We love you and we desperately need, to, need you. Speak to us through your word this morning. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen attention to details. Palm Sunday, it is a reminder that our God and Savior was attentive to the details. There are three ways we're going to see this in the text this morning. The first one I'd have you to grasp, grasp is 
We're going to look at verses 28 through 33, and it's this. He provides a picture, a perfect picture to imperfect people. He provides a perfect picture to imperfect people. To the text, verse 28, it says, after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Belfast and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a coat tied in which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the coat, its owner said to them, why are you untying the coat? They said, the Lord has need of it. Here we find Jesus. He's getting ready, ready to enter into Jerusalem, knowing this is like this is the last week of his life. In fulfilling fulfillment of prophecy, he summons his disciples. He sends them on a mission to retrieve a donkey, a donkey which had never been used before, in which he would use this to ride into Jerusalem. How about this? A perfect picture that he provides to imperfect people. Of all the ways Jesus could have entered the city, why would he choose this way? Why would he enter on a donkey's coat? Well, the interesting significance of this, it fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah verse 9 through 9. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But it also gives us a picture of God's pattern in the Old Testament. If you go back and read in Numbers chapter number 19, when God was given the priests, their priestly duties on how to uh, submit an appropriate sacrifice. In Numbers chapter 19, verse 2, you find these words. This is the statue of the law, which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, that they bring you an unblemished red heifer in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never been mounted. In other words, the Lord was telling Israel, as if they were going to submit appropriate sacrifice, they would submit something that had been untampered with. In this case, a donkey that had never been ridden. Jesus was so committed to fulfilling the will of the Father in perfect unity and surrender. That he gives even in his last week of his life a picture perfect, a perfect picture to some imperfect people. Brothers and sisters, the good news about Palm Sunday is we see the attentiveness to detail of the Savior to fulfill all the promises of the Father so that we'd have no excuse to believe that he is the Messiah. See this beautiful, glaring evidence that the Lord gives us then, but he also moves and gives us evidence today. The greatest evidence God provided then and even provides today is by fulfilling his word, what he's declared he would do. Here, can't you see Jesus? He gives us a perfect picture. And yet he provides this perfect picture to imperfect people. The good news, the hope that hangs for you this morning is, man, we have a perfect Savior that is so committed to the details, even in your life, that he gets involved. And sometimes and oftentimes the greatest way he gets involved is by sending you a word. It could be a word, the written word, but it's oftentimes even through the words of his people, his believers, he places around you. Maybe you are listening in. You've been wrestling with God, trying to wonder why it's so hard for you to believe. Well, my friend, I want to encourage you. The greatest way to have revelation unveiled to you is by spending time in his word. Man, get with another brother and sister in Christ. Man, I'm sure their story will encourage you, will help to win you over to believe in the hope of this beautiful Savior that has captured their heart and I'm confident it can capture yours. He provides a perfect picture to imperfect people. I don't know about you, but I know how imperfect I am. And if you've walked long enough, lived long enough, then you know, perhaps, I'm sure you've discovered that you too are imperfect, but yet we have a perfect savior that provides perfect pictures. But then also he's attentive to details. And we see this picking up at verse 35. His plan for them was greater than their plan for him. His plan for them 
was greater than their plan for him. Picking up at verse 35, it says, They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the coats and put Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he, he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Here, Jesus, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey's coat. They've placed their coats as a saddle for the Savior to sit on this never used donkey. He rides into the city. And all of a sudden, the crowd begins to declare glory to God. It's a picture. It's a it's a fulfillment of Zechariah, verse nine, chapter number nine, verse nine. In Zechariah nine, verse nine, it says, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. Even on a coat, the fowl of a donkey. Here, the people are, they're looking at Jesus. They've watched him perform miracles. They've heard about his healing the sick and raising the dead. And they think this must be the one. Now, what's interesting to note is where their hope and their praise was really rooted in. The people, they were excited about the Savior coming, this Messiah coming, and their hopes was not just in them bringing um, just relief, but ultimately their hope was found in them bringing, free him, them, bringing, him bringing them liberation or freedom. Because earlier in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 8, the preceding verse, look what it says. It says, but I will camp around my house because of an army. Because of him who passes by and returns and no oppressor will pass over them any more. For now I have seen my eyes. In other words, here Israel is. Here's the crowd declaring man, he is the one who's going to set us free from the oppression of Rome. That is what the people were excited about. They were excited about liberation. They were excited about freedom. They were excited about this yoke being lifted off their neck that Rome had placed upon them. They were tired of Rome and likely their hopes were that Jesus would make things better for them. Is that not your problem, my problem with Jesus even today? Our sole purpose in coming to Jesus oftentimes can be that we want Jesus to make things better for us. Well, the hope, encouragement, and challenge in this text is that Jesus' plan for us is greater than our plan for him. My friend, the good news, the hope in this text is rooted in the reality that, that Jesus' plan for you, Jesus' plan for me, is greater than my plan for him. You see, Jesus was not coming just to liberate them from the oppression of Rome. But Jesus was coming to liberate them from the oppression and bondage of sin. The greatest barrier, the greatest burden, the greatest yoke upon our necks is not just freedom in this life, but it's freedom and reconciliation with God. It's freedom from the yoke and burden of sin. See, Jesus was coming to bring peace, but not peace in the way they wanted, per se. He was bringing peace with God. The beauty the attentiveness to detail of this Savior is that his plan for them was greater than their plan for him. My friend, maybe that is the opportunity for you this morning. Your hopes and your dreams for God, your hopes and your dreams for Jesus are still so much smaller than his hopes and dreams for you. Your plans for Jesus, there's so much great, his plans are so much greater for him to be at work even in your life than your plans for him working in your life. Maybe Jesus, and the reminder he wants you to experience this morning, is that his plan for you is greater than your plan for you. But also his view of you 
is greater than your view of you. See, he came to set you free, not just freedom from oppression in these earthly systems, but most importantly, freedom from sin, the bondage of sin. We see his attentiveness to details. But the last thing we see, and don't miss this, is we see deceptive approval, disapproval confronted by divine applause. Deceptive disapproval, disapproval confronted by divine applause. Picking up at verse 39 and 40. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Check this out. The picture is the crowd is celebrating. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. People are laying down palm branches. They're excited. They're welcoming him into Jerusalem. Our king has arrived. The Pharisees worried about news getting back to Rome and Caesar sending Roman guards perhaps to, to prevent an uprising. Say, Jesus, you, you don't understand the, 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 what, what you're calling. Jesus, you need to quiet them. Do you understand what may happen if you don't silence this crowd? Jesus says, no, no, no. Do you understand what will happen if I silence this crowd? He says, this moment, what they're declaring, it is so biblical. It, it is so necessary that if they went silent, the rocks, lifeless tools would cry out in their place. What comes to mind as I think about that, I think about Paul's words in Romans chapter number eight. In Romans chapter number eight, this beautiful uh, declaration of, of, of just this reminder and beauty of, of what God is doing. Paul, he writes these words in Romans chapter number eight, verses 19 through 22. He says, for the, for the, for the eagerly awaiting cre creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What Paul does is in Romans 8 is he reminds us of what happened in the garden. Back in Genesis, when Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God, all of creation was cursed. All of humanity, but all of, so all that man had authority over was cursed by their decision. Paul, thinking about that, 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 that horror, horrible day, he looks back and he says, look, the gospel is so precious. And why is it so precious? It's so precious because what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22 is the beauty. He gives, shows us the beauty and far reaching impact of the gospel. It is such that all of creation has been longing for its culmination, for God to usher in his kingdom. Jesus says, boys, I need you to understand. If they were to keep silent, you don't understand that man, the rocks would cry out in the place. That is the type of praise and adoration that this moment requires. The good news for you is that Jesus was attentive to details so that you and I would have no excuse in believing and being fully convinced that he is the Messiah. He obeyed scripture in every way. He fulfilled prophecy. Numerous hundreds of prophecies were fulfilled down to the details so that you and I might have no excuse in believing that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Praise God that he is a God who is attentive to the details. My friend, the good news in this text, the good news of Palm Sunday, is it, man, he has not changed. He's the same God yesterday and today and forevermore. And the same God that was attentive to the details then is just as attentive to the details at play in your life here and now. So the opportunity for you 
is to behold this precious Savior, to examine him, to see if he is who scripture declares that he is. And I'm convinced, as he's convinced me, I'm confident he will convince you that this Savior, that you will fall deep in love with him and you will come to discover how great his plan and purpose is for your life as it is for mine. Well, thanks again for tuning in. I pray that you will marvel afresh this week as you just look back on God's love for you and his demonstration and him walking this Roman road so that we might come to saving faith. So as we prepare our hearts for Easter, I just pray that the truth and the beauty of the Palm Sunday interaction will cause your heart to be uh, awakened to the beauty and hope of the gospel. Well, let me pray, and I'm going to turn it back over to the capable hands of our worship team. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, I pray that you would just grip our hearts afresh as we study and examine these scriptures. God, may we be a wooed again by your attentiveness to the details. We love you, we praise you, and we desperately need you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. But thanks again for tuning in. I'm going to now turn it over to the capable hands of our worship team. They're going to lead us in song, and I'll be back to share with you a couple things that's taking place here at the Midtown Bridge. God bless. So 
Don't you worry Lift up your head Oh, don't cry Why your eyes Well, hey, thanks again for tuning in to this broadcast. I pray and trust that you were encouraged by God's word. Well, hey, this week, as we prepare for Easter, I want to encourage you all to be praying this week to even start reaching out to those in your sphere of influence and invite them out to our Easter service this next Sunday. On Sunday, April the 4th, we're going to gather, weather permitting, in our, on the Atlantic Green outside in Atlantic Station for a time of worship. And we have an amazing time. We're going to be kicking off a new series called Expectations. And I believe this is going to be perhaps maybe one of the most relevant messages maybe I've ever preached here at the Midtown Bridge. So invite a guest, family, friend, co-worker. You want them to be with us on Easter Sunday. Easter is such a, a divine opportunity for us to so invite those who may not yet be walking with the Lord to hear the gospel proclaimed. And so please join us. We've made it easy for you to share an uh, invite digitally by, by social media or email. Uh, you can go to our website and you can actually copy and paste into your, uh, your, your uh, social media feed and invite and uh, invite some of your friends, co-workers and neighbors out to this service on Easter Sunday. I also want to invite you all this Wednesday to gather with, with us in community group. You're going to have just a time of just reflection and perhaps even worship just to get our hearts ready uh, for Easter Sunday. So that's going to take place this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. online. Thanks again for tuning in. Let me pray God's blessing upon you as we get ready to enter into a new week. Father, we love you and we pray and trust that you will go before us, that you will guide and order our steps. Give us courage and make us bold, God, to hold and share the gospel with those who cross our paths of influence. We love you and we praise you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in and have a great week.